Hello and welcome. My name is Sebastian Weiss and I will be presenting you our work Learning Adaptive Sampling and Reconstruction for Volume Visualization. This work was published to TVCG in 2020. Isosurface rendering can be made fairly efficient, but there are still some scenarios where the sample count has to be reduced. This drastically decreases the reconstruction quality. But in recent years, neural networks were able to retain some of the quality. However, we can achieve much better qualities by wisely choosing the position of the samples. Here you see a difference of this adaptive sampling with the adaptive sample positions and the constant stepping. And with this adaptive sampling scheme here, we achieve almost identical results to the ground truth with a fairly low number of samples. Adaptive sampling is a very old topic in rendering. For example, Painter and Sloan presented an adaptive refinement scheme for ray tracing in 1989, or Q et al. presented, for example, a method via the Celis entropy to estimate where more samples might be needed in 2005. Specifically tailored to volume rendering, Lee Boy presented in 1919 adaptive refinement scheme for volume rendering. And for example, Freight all a uh, ref progressive refinement scheme again for direct volume rendering in 2014. With respect to neural networks, in a previous work of our, we showed that neural networks are very powerful for upscaling tasks. So in this work, a four times upscaling project. Or the work most related to this current work is by Kuznetsov et al. from 2018, where they used adaptive sampling for Monte Carlo path tracing, where a neural network estimates how many samples should be taken per pixel between one and many. However, for direct volume rendering, actually one sample per pixel is already enough for a noise-free image. Therefore, we are more interested in where to place samples between zero and one, so where at all and where not. And this is achieved in the following way. First, a low resolution image is rendered. And the first importance network then estimates the, imp um, the importance map. For this network, we use a variation of the enhanced net by Sacha D. et al. from 2017, a small um, residual neural network that performs an upscaling of eight times in total. From this importance map, we render the sparse samples. For this, we first normalize the importance map to a mean mu and a minimal value L. This minimal value L ensures that there are at least some samples in outside areas, and the mean mu gives, um, determines then the final sample count. For example, if we want only 5% of samples, we set the mean mu to 0.05. This allows us to uncouple the training from the testing. For example, during training, we can say we render with 10% of samples, but then during testing, we can vary this sample count freely via this normalization step. And then the actual rendering is done via a rejection sampling, where for each pixel, we sample a random number uniformly between zero and one, and then invoke the renderer if the importance at this pixel is higher than this random number. However, this has two disadvantages. First, we actually show in the paper that it's advantages to use a fixed sampling pattern based on some specific low discrepancy sampler. More specifically, plastic sampling as introduced by robots in 2018. And to uh, improve the training um, performance, we make use of the reference images in high resolution that are available for the supervised losses either way. And with this, we can reformulate this re um, rejection sampling as a simple pixel selection via step function. However, this is the second disadvantage. This is not differentiable. Therefore, during training, we replace the step function by a, a smooth sigmoid function. And here the hyperparameter alpha determines the steepness of the function. For a study on how this influences the training quality, please have a look at the paper. Now that we have the samples, 
we first interpolate them and then a second neural network enhances the quality of the output. The interpolation is done via variation of the pull-push algorithm as presented by Krauss in 2019. Here you can see the two inputs to the, inter to the in painting. On the left, the data from the renderer. On the right, the binary sample mask. Then, during the pull-push, the images are downscaled and the contributions from a 2x2 two two window are weighted based on the sample mask. So only the actual samples contribute to this interpolation during downscaling. Then, while we upscale the images again, we retain the, the samples from the same resolution, so if the sample mask was one there, and if not, we bilinearly interpolate the pixel from the lower resolution. This allows us to keep us the actual samples from the renderer and smoothly fill the, into the empty areas. This whole pull-push pull push algorithm consists only of up and down scaling and is fully differentiable with respect to the sampling mask and input data. After this in-painting, a second neural network, again a variation of the enhanced net, improves upon this result. For a detailed study on the effect of do we actually need this network or are there of or the variations of the network architecture, please have a look at the paper. The whole pipeline is then drained end to end via supervised losses. Let's have a look at some results. Most importantly, how does the, um, the reconstruction quality relates to the number of samples? Here you can see a baseline where, you, where we use a constant importance map, so everywhere a uniformly sampling, and then the in-painting and reconstruction network. And unsurprisingly, the quality increases with the number of the samples. We can compare ourselves here with our previous work where we used a fixed upscaling network of four times. This means around 6% uh, of samples, and we actually achieve pretty much the identical quality with this new adaptive pipeline, except that now we can actually vary the number of samples. However, to make fully use of this, when we enable the, the importance, the first neural network that estimates the importance map, we, are, we arrive at a much better quality. Furthermore, the networks were trained only on the ejector dataset, but they generalize well without any retraining on completely novel datasets. For example, here, a CT scan of the human skull. Here you see the reconstruction and a comparison against the ground truth. Or here for a second example with a, with a Richtmeier Meshkov dataset. For further examples and quantitative results, please have a look at our paper. Here you can see again the reconstruction and a comparison against the ground truth. We can also apply the same pipeline for direct volume rendering. Now the, the renderer doesn't render an isosurface, but instead a volume rendering with color and also the network predicts colors or the reconstruction network. Here you can see that the reconstruction fairly well matches the ground truth, even for this complex scene. So far I haven't spoken about timings. For the previous example of the ejector dataset with a volume resolution of 512 to the cube and a screen resolution of, for example, 1024 to the square, the individual steps take this number of time. For example, the rendering takes 46 milliseconds. This includes the low resolution rendering and the sparse sampling. Then the first network that estimates the importance map takes around six milliseconds. The second network for the reconstruction plus the in-painting step takes around 92 milliseconds. In total, this gives rise to a runtime of 144 milliseconds, which is already faster than a ground truth rendering of 224 milliseconds. How does the scale with the volume resolution and the screen resolution? This is a table which is typical for all tests here. The first cell um, per cell, we plot the 
the time in milliseconds, first for the whole pipeline and the second value for the ground truth rendering. For a low screen resolution and low number of um, voxels, the a regular rendering is faster than the whole pipeline. However, for larger screen sizes, larger volumes, there's a turning point where this adaptive sampling pipeline becomes faster. This turning point differs from um, scene to scene, step size to step size or other optimization strategies. But so far we've always observed it. And this brings me to the end of our talk. We've presented an adaptive sampling pipeline for volume rendering and we think that this, this basic idea on how to adaptively sample um, can be extended, for example, to an op adaptive object representation, like decide where to use which mipmap level in a large volume. Or it can also be used to adapt the step size. However, this requires a differentiable renderer and a first step into this direction was taken by a follow-up work of ours on differentiable direct volume rendering also presented at this conference. Thank you for your attention and the code with all the data is available online.